Hello and welcome to the latest in our Insider interview video series. Today I have with me Paul Marriage, who is manager of the Telworth UK Smaller Companies Fund. Paul, thanks for joining us today. Well, thanks for having me, Carl. It's been a challenging period for stock markets generally so far this year, but UK smaller companies have been hit particularly hard. Why have UK smaller companies been so out of favour? I think they're just a risk asset. So you buy UK smaller companies for its ability to make you great long-term returns over a long period of time because you're buying companies when they're growing at their fastest rate in a company's evolution. When markets are scared about things like uh, a war in Europe or macroeconomic issues, you know, it's UK small cap, it's the sort of asset you run away from, really. It's not, it's not something you buy on first missile, unfortunately, and it's not something you really buy when you're worried about the domestic economy. Historically, quite a strong perception that UK small caps are quite domestic. I think actually over the years, that's become much less the case. But it's one of those sort of go, go from assets when, when the market's worried about macro risks. So that's probably what's happening. We're kind of used to that, unfortunately. You know, you wouldn't be a small cap manager if you couldn't take these periods where yeah, it's really out of favour uh, and people don't really want to know you because you know that around the corner there'll be a period when you're really in favour and you can make people great returns. So you've got to take the long view. Over the short term, what do you think the potential investment catalyst will be for investor sentiment to improve? Do you think it will be a better second half of the year for UK smaller companies? Yeah, I mean, it's a sort of multi-trillion dollar question, isn't it? But um, I think basically what normally happens is people kind of get over grumpy. Yeah, so the stock market loves to really look forward. So, so it's at the point that we get to peak grumpiness about everything, you know, whether it's the domestic economy, the cost of living crisis, really noisy at the moment on all those things, in Ukraine as well. Um, and, and it's at a point at which you say, well, actually, can things get any worse? And if you've decided that things can't get much worse, in, in terms of perception. Physically, actually, numbers could get worse, but you've decided that mentally, as you've had enough bad news, you start to think, well, actually, 23 could be a recovery year, or maybe 24. And you think, well, actually, on 23 numbers, profits, this stock isn't perhaps so bad. So then we'd start to see people buying mid and large cap first, and then generally small cap later, maybe two or three weeks later into a market turnaround. And then of course, small caps generally go kind of stronger for longer in that period. So I think we're in a really interesting time right now, actually, where there's lots and lots of bad news out there. Companies are still talking relatively positively. Their outlooks are we're conscious of a tough environment, um, but actually people aren't really warning at the moment. So it might be when people actually say, look, second half is going to be tough for us. We need to reduce full year forecast. That might actually be the buying opportunity because finally we've stopped waiting for the bad news. We've got the bad news. It's there. It's a reality. We can now buy the market. So I think your sort of second half or maybe in Q4 theory isn't, isn't a bad one, actually. Over the long term, on a 10-year view, are you confident that UK smaller companies can outperform UK larger companies? Indeed, the history books do show us that over the very long term, UK smaller companies do have the upper hand. Yeah, absolutely. So I kind of wouldn't be doing this job if I didn't believe that. Um, but it does go back to that. If you're buying companies at the point at which they're growing the fastest, they're riskier then because they, they, may, they may fail. They may not succeed in growing and becoming large companies. But if you're getting most of that growth phase, you've got a really good chance of outperforming. If you think about it a little bit, the way I sometimes think about it is, you know, we're buying companies that can kind of walk, talk and feed themselves. You know, they're like toddlers. Yeah, so they're age three. Uh, and we're owning them from sort of three to teenagers to 14. So that share price might be going from three pounds to 14 pounds. They become annoying, grumpy teenagers at 14, get rid of them, you know. Um, so that, that is a period of maximum growth. Now from 14 to 28, the next doubling, they're going to be a FTSE 250 company, it might take three or four years. Whereas in that first three years, we've got a four or five times share price appreciation. So that's how over 10 years, you generally get these long-term outperformances. We even looked at, you know, the last five years kind of, Post-Brexit, it's been a pretty ugly time to be in UK stocks, as we well know. But actually, even in that period, small caps have outperformed. So uh, in tough times, they've outperformed too. So, so overall, I think um, you, know, we, we, you have got to take the long view if you're doing small caps. We know it's a riskier asset. We know it's a bit less liquid. Um, but yeah, fundamentally believe that that long-term outperformance means it's got a place in every portfolio. The sell-off in UK smaller company stocks in recent months, has that presented you an opportunity to add new positions or increase existing holdings? Yeah, it, you always think sell-off, going to buy some more stuff. 
Uh, and then you sort of looked at it and think, well, actually, is that one going to get a bit cheaper? What's my market timing on actually when I want to buy that? Because so, sort of anything you brought earlier in the year, you're thinking, oh, I should have waited until today. And maybe today you think, well, maybe I'll wait until next month. So, yeah, we do top stuff up. Uh, we top existing positions up. Uh, a couple of good examples would be um, MPAC, uh, which is a, a, a sort of packaging equipment business. So it's automating packaging and systems in factories. So, you know, as people take an expensive labor cost out and, you know, inflationary drivers, maybe an investment in a few hundred thousand pounds worth of higher tech machinery, the kind of things MPAC make will probably be something companies will look at. Um, they also have very interesting uh, fuel cell manufacturing technology that's being trialed in Norway. We think that's potentially really exciting. MPAC shares have come, come back sort of 20%. Feels to us like that long-term opportunity is still very much there with some short-term positive drivers too. So topped up MPAC to a sensible position size, quite a difficult one to trade. So using that more volatile market, a little bit more stock on offer. Um, Stock we sold last year because we felt it performed really, really well was GB Group. We'd held it for quite a long time. It kind of almost become a mid cap. GB Group is a world leading software company in identity. So when you're buying something online, your identity is being checked. There's kind of postcode checks, but other identity checks. You know, GB is one of the few people globally who can do that in lots of different jurisdictions. Uh, business that originally started in Manchester, been a UK small cap for a long time, good long term success story. Shares did really, really well. Uh, we sold them actually, and then, then kind of luckily, sometimes you you know you're better lucky than good. They did quite a large acquisition. The stock market didn't really like. Share price halved. Um, just had a reasonably good set of numbers. We saw the company again, uh, and we've bought back in. Around a third of the fund is invested in the AIM market. Where are you finding the best opportunities on that market? And are there certain parts of the market that are too risky for you to invest in? Yeah, there's definitely some really risky bits of AIM. You know, I talked about mining, biotechs, oil and gas exploration, and micro caps. And that's a, that's a decent chunk of AIM. Um, you've got to remember the big thing that's, that, that's changed in probably the last 10 years, but maybe a little bit longer, is AIM has very much become the chosen market to list on. So if you are a small company worth kind of naught to three or 400 million, pretty difficult not to say AIM's the best place. It's a bit cheaper and it's a bit more flexible. So new companies listing on the FTSE small cap, um, uh, much, much rarer these days. So naturally, a small cap fund manager has seen AIM rise as some of those stocks that maybe 10 or 15 years ago would have been small cap stocks on day one and now AIM stocks on day one. So so the, we've always had loads of AIM. We really like AIM. It's been a pretty tough market, actually. It's a tough market again this year. It was a tough market last year. But there's so many stocks on there. That if you're really disciplined about your stock selection, you can find some great long-term winners. So AIM is going to be really important for us in the future. It has been for a long time. We were one of the early investors in AIM, uh, and, and it is, it's a good market. But like all markets, it's a bit wild west in places, and you've really got to pick and choose and be disciplined. So that approach I, I, I've talked about before, about meeting lots of companies, excluding the riskiest things, um, really helps us get rid of the casino stocks, uh, and then you've got a better chance of of avoiding the biggest risks on AIM. Could you give a couple of examples of AIM companies that could be great long-term winners? Yeah, well, I think one of the things about AIM is you've always got a whole load of companies that think they're going to be superheroes, yeah? And it's kind of the same about most stock markets. Um, but if you looked at something like a Traxxas, yeah, so Traxxas has been around the stock market a little while. Um, it is a really interesting world leader in rail tech. Yeah. So people talk about fintech, they talk about health tech, rail tech. You know, it is technology for rail. We need more of it. We need to move more people more efficiently around uh, countries. And, you know, we have one of the global leaders in the UK uh, in Traxxas. So I think that's a business that if it keeps delivering on its growth uh, and its opportunities, particularly in the UK, as other rail networks globally invest more in technology, really well placed, you know, relatively small company, not that well known. I think that's a really good example of you know, sensible valuation of an AIM stock that could kind of emerge to be a bigger company. And finally, do you personally invest in the Telworth UK Smaller Companies yeah, Fund? Yeah, absolutely. It's, uh, it's my largest uh, fund position. Uh, uh, and yeah, absolutely. Skin in the game. I'm also a you know, reasonably large owner of uh, Telworth as well. Um, so you know, I've got skin in the game. The fund needs to do well if Telworth does well, and I own the fund as well. So I think I'm pretty aligned. Paul, thank you very much for your time today. Well, thanks very much, Carl. I've really enjoyed it. That's all we have time for for today. You can check out the rest of our Insider interview video series on our YouTube channel where you can like and subscribe. Hopefully see you next time.